Good evening. Welcome. My name is Ethan Vesley Flad. I am the Director of National Organizing at the Fellowship of Reconciliation USA. I'm delighted to welcome you all this evening to our program, a conversation with Sheila Collins, author of Ubuntu, George M. Hauser, and the Struggle for Peace and Freedom on Two Continents. Thank you all for joining us today for this uh, exciting talk about this brand new book. We're delighted to uh, enjoy, welcome all of you from around the, the nation to this program. And I want to give a little bit of an overview and then welcome our, our guest for the evening. And we're going to try to keep our program this evening to about 75 minutes. And we'll be uh, having Sheila Collins offer a talk and then a portion of time where we invite questions from all of you. Um, and we encourage you to use the chat function in Zoom for those of you who may be using Zoom for one of your first times, um, which is probably doubtful at this point in our country. But <laughs> um, I just want to point out that there are two important functionalities um, at the bottom of your screen. And one is to ensure that your line is muted. Uh, for as much as the time, unless you're uh, welcomed in to ask a question for the audio. And the other is that there's a chat functionality, and you can use the chat to share uh, comments, questions, and otherwise. And I would invite everyone here to use the chat uh, in these first few minutes of our time together to share your name, where you're from, uh, the indigenous people of the land where you are located, and um, if you would like to share something specific to how you are connected to this topic, particularly to George and Jean Hauser, um, that would be most invited. We're especially honored and delighted to have members of the Hart Hauser family with us this evening. It's great to see you, Marty, and I imagine there are other members of your family uh, as well. Um, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We're really blessed by that. Um, and so please do use the chat to share some uh, thoughts and perspectives and connections to uh, today's program and to share your questions for when we get to that point in the program. Um, I want to uh, also note that um, we will be, uh, 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 well, I think I'll start with uh, the fact that we're really delighted uh, uh, to have this program with Sheila, not least, of course, because F4 has a depth of connection to George's life and ministry and work through the decades, his time working on our national staff in the 1940s and 1950s, and the other ways that he was deeply connected to the past 106 years of our Fellowship of Reconciliation, but also um, because we provided a small form of support to Sheila in this fantastic project that took her many years to pull together this really fantastic text. And I'm gonna hold up my copy and I will encourage everyone, if you have not yet had the opportunity to get a copy of the book, we will be putting into the chat information about how you can do so with a very special opportunity to purchase it in this new hardcover or ebook version uh, through the publisher for a serious discount, 45% uh, off um, for the next two days um, through an FOR special promo code. So we invite you to consider that. But now we'll turn to the program. Um, it's a real uh, great honor to invite um, Sheila Collins, who um, is a professor emeritus of political science and, and a public intellectual. She's published several books. Um, this is her most recent one, obviously, um, but uh, another one of her recent titles was When Government Helped Learning from the Successes and Failures of the New Deal, which came out in 2013. Um, this <clears throat> particular project she spent many years working on in uh, partnership with um, members of the Hauser family and uh, many, many others who knew George's life and work through years. And so uh, I now want to turn the program over to uh, Dr. Sheila Collins joining us from Westchester this evening. And um, I will make sure that your uh, 
line is unmuted and we invite you to offer some words about this fantastic new book. Welcome, Sheila. Okay, well, um, I'm delighted to be with all of you and especially those of you who've had such a long connection with uh, George Hauser. Um, when I was contemplating what I would do as a retirement project, um, <laughs> I decided to ask George, whom I knew, if anyone was working on his biography. And his answer was that he'd been thinking about it, but he'd never gotten around to it. Uh, I found this kind of peculiar because, uh, or peculiar that nobody had written about him because several of the people who he'd worked with over the years had had their biographies and autobiographies written, and yet no one had written about him. Uh, and he hadn't written about himself, except in the one book I, I'll mention later. Maybe it was because he would just couldn't stop his activism long enough uh, for the time it would take to write such a book, or perhaps it was his characteristic modesty because he was never one to toot his own horn. After I decided to write the book, uh, George sent a note to me saying that though he was very pleased that I'd taken on the project, he had mixed feelings about it. I have lived through, I have lived during exciting times, he said, and have managed to latch on to some of the historical developments that have made this period meaningful. I've played a role, but I certainly do not exaggerate my contribution. I wouldn't want to make it more than it is, unquote. Now, I think Hauser was far too modest. It wasn't until I started working on the uh, book that I was able to appreciate just how far reaching and significant his work for peace and social justice had been. In a seminal book on the origins of the civil rights movement, Alden Morris has argued that movements that change the course of history don't spring up spontaneously, but are the work of countless unsung organizers who prepare the soil ahead of time. Hauser was just such a man, a pioneer who set the stage for others. As Julius Nieri, Tanzania's first president said of him, quote, the most important people in the world are often those who work quietly in the background of events, devoting their lives to the causes in which they believe. Without them, there would be no triumph. George Hauser is such a man, unquote. Perhaps because he was a white man whose life was devoted to working for freedom and justice for people of color, Hauser's name is today relatively unknown, except to those closely connected to the movements he initiated. Now, what kind of a man was he? He was a man of seemingly contradictory parts. Although a deeply committed pacifist who went to prison rather than support the war machine, he would later support those engaged in armed struggle in Africa. He was a white man who, of course, dedicated his life to the liberation of peoples of color, a devout Christian who worked with people of different faiths or none at all, or as well as, well as those of different ideological commitments, seeing his work for freedom and self-determination as his ministry. He was an internationalist long before the world was connected through the internet, a man who took the long view of history and was quick to seize the fulcrums of change years before that change was recognized by the larger society. He was a gentle man who was nevertheless drawn to risk and adventure, a fearless man who rarely talked about the courage it took to take up unpopular causes, to build organizations with no funding, and to risk his life in the service of others. He was a man who liked to be in the center of action, yet remained in the background, rarely seeking prominence. And he was a devoted family man, as I'm sure some of those Marty and others can attest, the father of four children who nevertheless spent a great deal of time abroad. Over the course of his life, uh, George would come to know and work with most of the great figures of the American civil rights movement, as well as all of the emerging leaders of the African anti-colonial movements. He was born in 1916 and lived to the ripe old age of 99 
and during all of his adult years, with the exception probably of the last couple, he never ceased his work for social justice. Uh, because of this, I therefore had to immerse myself in a great deal of history um, in order to provide a context for his life and work. I thought I was pretty familiar with the 1930s, the period during which he came of age, because I have written about the New Deal and, and Roosevelt um, and also taught about that. But in researching his life, I also discovered some things about the 1930s that I had been largely ignorant of. And likewise, his early civil rights work was only sketchily known by me. But it, it was his work in Africa that forced me to give myself a crash course on modern African American, uh, modern African political history, uh, with which I had was unfamiliar. Hauser's archives are voluminous and scattered across four or five different university collections. So it took me over a dozen years to really finish the manuscript. And by the time I finished, I had so much material that the publisher has told me I had to cut it back by 40%, which was very painful. Um, the book is based not only on archival materials, uh, but on private letters that George uh, uh, allowed me to read and a series of interviews I conducted with George and his wife, Jean, as well as with some 25 people who either, either worked with him or knew him. Unfortunately, many of the ones I would like to have uh, interviewed had passed away. Hauser's international outlook was forged early on by his having spent five of his childhood years as the son of missionaries in the Philippines, as well as a year as a college exchange student in China during a time of great upheaval in that society. In the first chapter, I've made extensive use of letters he wrote home to his parents during his year abroad. And in them, we see the gradual development of his character from that of an idealistic but naive young man into a thoughtful, more sophisticated and more politically astute person as he encounters a culture so very different from his own and wrestles with its implications for his own life and religious orientation. That chapter also examines several important socio-political currents of the interwar years that also helped to shape him. These included the economic crisis of the Great Depression, which spawned the first mass militant student movement that had both secular and religious offshoots. The student movement led young people like George to question both the logic and value of American capitalism and its connection with the war machine. This of course dovetailed with the isolationism that was the zeitgeist of the 1930s. There was also the example of a vibrant pacifist movement, which most of you on this call are familiar with, and the influence of the social gospel. The religious offshoot of the student movement was the student Christian movement, SCM, which was made up of mainline Protestant campus ministries and organizations linked to one another and to their partners overseas through the World Student Christian Federation, or WSCF. WSCF was one of the earliest manifestations of the ecumenical movement and the oldest international student organization. As early as 1913, race relations emerged uh, as a concern within the S, uh, WSCF and eventually pacifism and economic justice also. With its emphasis on student leadership in the service of a peaceful and just community, human community, the student Christian movement would groom many young people for leadership roles in progressive movements worldwide. Hauser was among those who received this training, as were several of the people he would work with over the coming years, and several of those whom my husband and I had come to know as well. Hauser would find his calling in the militant Methodist student movement, the denominational offshoot of the SCM. As a high school and college student, he attended summer and weekend institutes at which internationally renowned social gospelers like 
Sherwood Eddy and Kirby Page expose the racism and imperialism lurking within American exceptionalism and inspired students to commit themselves to eradicating these evils. Other influences during this time were the Socialist Party and its youth wing, the Young People's Socialist League, which George would join, and the contemporary example of Gandhi and his direct uh, nonviolent direct action as a means of social change. Articles about Gandhi uh, fill the newspapers of the day. In addition, there was the Oxford Pledge. In 1933, Oxford University students had pledged to refuse to fight for king and country. And this pledge was replicated in the US. During its peak years from 1936 to 1939, the US student movement mobilized about half the student body in one hour strikes against the war, against war period. Hauser's father, a Methodist Episcopal clergyman, had envisioned that his son would take the path he had chosen. The senior Hauser had served pulpits in several cities in the US, as well as a stint as a missionary. George, however, rejected his father's path as too safe and comfortable. He feared that the allure of being a popular minister in a big church with a large salary would cause him to compromise his principles. Instead, his religious calling took him into the turbulent centers of a struggle for peace and racial justice at home and African liberation from colonial rule abroad. <clears throat> the second chapter of the book covers the years, uh, his years as one of a group of eight radical pacifists who attended Union Theological Seminary from 1938 to 1940. When the first peacetime draft was announced in 1940, these men were the first to resist registration, even though as seminarians, they could have been exempt from, uh, from the draft. Um, they rejected even the status of conscientious objection. For this, for this, the Union Aid, as they were called, received national notoriety and uh, were sent to prison for a year and a day. Unsupported by the seminary president and faculty, uh, they would pay for their refusal by, uh, as I said, spending nearly a year in prison and some of that time in solitary confinement. Hauser and his fellow war resistors set the example for war resistors who would follow, as well as launching a movement inside prison that challenged the petty authoritarianism and racism of the system. News of their example soon spread to COs in other prisons, eventually culminating in the desegregation of parts of the prison system. Hauser's prison experience gave him a great deal of time to think about what he wanted to do with his life. It was a turning point, and after it, there would be no turning back. I've made extensive use of Hauser's prison letters to both his seminary friend, Roger Shin, and to his future wife, Jean Walline. In his letters to Shin, we see him wrestling with questions of resistance to militarism and the efficacy of minority action. Shin had his own internal battle about whether to accept the seminarian's exemption from the draft. With his wavering convictions about pacifism, Shin was the perfect interlocutor for Hauser, each of them posing questions and critiques of the other's positions on the best way of responding to the threat of Nazism. Shin would go on to enlist and fight at the Battle of the Bulge, endure 171 days of brutal interrogation by the Nazis, and a 600-mile forced march through Germany during the waning days of the war. He would later assume a position as professor of ethics at Union Seminary and write a book entitled War and Rumors of War. Despite their differences, the two men remained lifelong friends. Hauser's letters to Jean, which I've also used, reveal the development of a sweet epistolary courtship that was to culminate in a marriage of over 70 years. On release from prison, Hauser was unable to return to Union because he and his comrades had refused to promise that they would bring no more negative publicity to the seminary. 
He was welcomed, however, at Chicago Theological Seminary, whose president was also a pacifist and would finish his senior year there. While Hauser was in prison, A.J. Musty <clears throat> had offered him a part-time job as student field organizer in, Ch in Chicago after his release. Hauser's job was to organize students into cells to study books on Gandhi's method of nonviolent direct action with the hope that they could utilize that method in the cause of peace. Hauser, however, along with two of Musty's other recruits, Bayard Rustin and Jim Farmer, was soon drawn to using Gandhi's method to tackle racial discrimination in public accommodations, housing, and transportation. The 17 cells he organized in Chicago in time became the foundation for the Congress of Racial Equality a national federation of autonomous groups scattered in northern and border areas across the country. In 1945, CORE elected Hauser's, Hauser as its part-time unsalaried executive secretary. He served in that capacity for over a decade while also holding down a job with the FOR. Because he was CORE's coordinator, the early CORE efforts bore the imprint of his approach to nonviolent direct action. He insisted that the organizations be interracial, as he put it, quote, while Negroes would form the mass base of such an organization, the movement must not exclude white persons from membership. Such a movement has a strategic advantage against white bigots, as it would be impossible for race baiters to say that they were being persecuted simply by Negroes. The fact that Negroes and whites are working together in the same organization undermines the racist theory that the two races can't mix. And finally, it gives white persons who are anxious to oppose discrimination an opportunity for real action." Unquote. Hauser also insisted that the end result of any action should be reconciliation. His guidelines for direct action campaigns stressed that civil disobedience was to be used as a last resort after other kinds of internet interventions had failed. Um, Hauser, however, didn't see reconciliation in the kind of um, simplistic terms that so many people understand it. I, I think he saw it in, in the way South Africans saw reconciliation as uh, reparations, the, the call for justice and, and repentance on the part of those who had uh, uh, sinned. And although segregation was outlawed, outlawed in the North, there was considerable de facto segregation. Throughout the 1940s, the subject of the book's third chapter, Core would model the repertoire of civil disobedience tactics that would be adopted by civil rights activists in the 1960s. Sit-ins and stand-ins, picketing, boycotts, marches, negative publicity, and so on. Actions were taken at roller skating rinks, restaurants, hotels, theaters, amusement parks, swimming pools, public beaches, playgrounds, and barber shops, and on public transportation. As early as 1947, which you all probably know about, Hauser and Rustin organized the first freedom ride into the South, dubbed the Journey of Reconciliation. Not all of course campaigns ended in immediate victory. Campaigns against employment and housing discrimination were particularly intractable. But in, in a number of Northern and border cities, as a result of CORE's efforts, discriminatory policies and public accommodations were permanently changed and discrimination on some interstate train lines was banned. The courage of these early civil rights activists should not be underestimated. Violence was often used against them, even in the North, where segregation was supposed to be illegal. Although Hauser and Farmer had hoped that their efforts would result in a mass civil rights movement, conditions were not yet ripe. But in generating press attention, core activists served to inform and educate a wider audience about the nature of institutionalized racism and strengthen the resolve of some of those affected by racism either to question their own compliance with Jim Crow laws or to look with sympathy on those who refuse to obey them.
During the 1940s, when race in the northern and border states had become increasingly spatialized, insulating whites from the recognition of their white privilege, the work of Hauser and his comrades in exposing racist patterns removed a number of those blinders. As one of the journalists who accompanied them on the journey of reconciliation wrote, based on what I saw, I think the journey of reconciliation knocked several props from beneath the already tottering Jim Crow structure. They wrote a new page in the history of America, unquote. And they paved the way for what was to come. Most of those involved in these civil disobedience campaigns remained lifelong activists for racial justice. Some, like Rustin and Har Farmer, went on to be key leaders in the civil rights movement in the 1960s. And the nonviolent training sessions designed by Hauser and Rustin would become the model for the nonviolent training sessions provided by Reverend James Lost in the 1960s. Perhaps Hauser's most far ranging contribution for, to the struggle for justice in the latter half of the 20th century was his role in founding and leading the American Committee on Africa, ACOA. The fourth chapter in the book covers Hauser's move from core to the beginnings of his interest in Africa. He became intrigued by Africa after his friend, Bill Sutherland, also a pacifist, returned from a trip through Europe where he had learned about the impending defiance campaign uh, of the ANC. While still working for CORE, Hauser began corresponding with leaders of the defiance campaign, offering to help their struggle. The result was the formation of Americans for South African Resistance, ASFAR for short. Armed with insider information from the freedom struggle, ASFAR managed to raise some funds to send to the South African freedom fighters and to publicize what was going on in South Africa. In the early 1950s, as he was doing this, the only other US organization that had paid any attention to Africa was the Council on African Affairs, whose roster included such people as Paul Robeson, W.B.D. Du Bois, Mary McLeod Bethune, and many others. However, this was an era of an intense anti-communism, and the council, which included some communists in its ranks, was a subject of fierce per persecution by the FBI and Justice Department. By 1955, it had ceased most activities, and by 56, it was shut down for good. This left Hauser and a small band of liberal non-communist pacifists to carry on the work of providing support for the African liberation movements. Hauser's group has been criticized by some scholars for refusing to work with the Council in Africa when it was still in existence. But it probably saved Hauser from being hauled before the House and American Activities Committee, allowing him and his organization to carry on the work the Council had begun. When the defiance campaign had to be shut down in 1953 because of severe repression, those whom Hauser had recruited to ask for his cause had to decide what to do. After much discussion, they decided to form another organization, which became the American Committee on Africa. This committee would not only work against the apartheid state, but would seek to support the anti-colonial movements that were just beginning to emerge all over the continent. In 1953, most of the continent was still under colonial dominance. An Afro-Asian effort to change the direction of the UN on colonial issues was just beginning, but it did little to challenge the status quo. The US State Department that was then enthralled to Cold War ideology had no Bureau of African Affairs, viewing African politics through the lens of their colonial allies and fearing the independence movements might turn to the Soviets for help. There were also no African studies departments in academia. So to start an organization that fo focused on an entire continent with no funds and with a public that still thought of Af Africa as the dark continent must have seemed like a fool's errand. But because of his work for civil rights in the US, Hauser was uniquely positioned to serve as a liaison between the civil rights movement at home and African liberation abroad.
he would eventually enlist all of the major Amer African American civil rights leaders in the cause of African liberation. From 1955, when Hauser took on the role of executive director of ACOA through the end of South African apartheid in 1994, this small interracial, always poorly funded organization would play a disproportionate role in introducing the leaders of emerging African independence movements to the world and securing their international legitimacy and in helping to build support for their causes. Starting out with little knowledge about Africa, Hauser would become one of the most knowledgeable Americans about the African independence movements. His extensive correspondence and discussions with African independence leaders whom he came to know intimately, the reports he brought back from his 34 trips through Africa during and after the wars for liberation, ACOA's support of African petitioners at the UN, as well as the US speaking tours he arranged for these leaders represent an important, I think, but under-recognized transatlantic dialogue. This interaction helped shape liberal thinking on race and racism during the Cold War, informing how activists on both sides of the ocean initiated their strategies in the fight against racial and colonial injustice. Africa Today, the oldest continuous journal providing scholarly analysis and discussion of African affairs, now published by Indiana University Press, was launched by ACOA and the organization's extensive files and research on Africa were widely used by journalists, historians, legislators, and activists seeking information. Included in the book are not only discussions of Hauser's philosophy and methods of action, but stories of high adventure as he risked his life many times in support of his mission. His life was full of dramatic moments, civil disobedience and frequent jailings, a 200 mile trek through the Angolan jungle and grasslands with a guerrilla group, a clandestine visit to South Africa under apartheid during which he was surveilled and interrogated, two harrowing rides across the Western Sahara with Muslims fighting for their independence from Morocco, a daring but unsuccessful attempt to fly into Namibia that was then controlled by South Africa having a gun pointed to the back of his head while observing Zimbabwe's first free elections. And in his late seventies, traveling twice with pastors for peace to Cuba to deliver medicine and other supplies in violation of the US embargo and having to sleep on cold church floors on the way. At the age of 93, getting hit with tear gas from Israeli soldiers during a fact-finding trip to Israel-Palestine. Hauser not only helped to make history, but was witness to some of Af Africa's pivotal events. He was invited to all three of the All African People's Conferences, as well as to the founding conference of the Organization of African Unity, to several inaugural events or celebrations for newly elected African leaders. And he served as, as an observer at some of Africa's free, first free elections. During each one of his trips, he kept extensive handwritten journals, writing up detailed reports on his observations and the discussions he held with people he sought, sought out from all walks of life. And I've made use of those journals as well in the, in the book. On his return, he would provide an analysis of the events he had witnessed for his supporters, for American legislators, UN personnel, and the general public. These notebooks, reports, and congressional and UN testimony, in addition to a book he authored, No One Can Stop the Rain, Glimpses of African's Liberation, Africa's Liberation Struggles, provide illuminating insights into the trials, the triumphs, and the tragedies of the struggle for liberation throughout the continent. During his leadership of the ACOA, Hauser's role was often hidden in the collective policy decisions made by the board, staff, and steering committee, and in the materials produced by the ACOA, which range from thousands of pages of print 
to large public events, conferences, speaking tours, public demonstrations, boycott campaigns, material aid for the liberation movements, material aid for the families of political prisoners and refugees, exhibitions of African art, and quiet dinners for African leader guests. Yet behind it all was Georgia's indefatigable, indefatigable energy, responding to every crisis that came along with yet another action campaign. At Hauser's retirement, Judge William Booth, a member of his board, commented, quote, to pay tribute to George is to recall a seemingly endless number of involvements. He is at the center of activity, hunting a new angle, meeting new people, trying a new strategy. Even his detractors testify to his commitment, unquote. He was a man who believed that persisting against all odds was the only way forward. George retired from the ACOA in 1981 at the age of 65 with a gala celebration that was filled with testimonies from dozens of African leaders whom he had befriended over the years. He'd always known that the struggle would be long and that he might not see its completion. Although his formal work with the ACOA was at an end, he was determined to continue the fight in other ways and re would remain a peace and justice activist for the next 30 or so years. It was, it was Hauser, a white man, who in 1962 had catalyzed the only African-American-led organization to challenge U.S. foreign policy, the American Negro Leadership Conference in Africa, until the emergence of Trans-Africa in 1978. Hauser was also responsible for initiating many of the campaigns that would, would eventually help to bring an end to apartheid. Among them were cultural and sports boycotts, the bank divest divestment movement, corporate shareholder resolutions, picketing of South Africa ships at US ports, the Krugerrand boycott, and many, many others. At his retirement, two South Africans whom he had hired, Jennifer Davis and Dumasani Kumalo, would carry on the ACOA's work, ACOA's work for a free South Africa until its conclusion. Kamala would later become free South Africa's first ambassador to the UN. When he started his work for social justice, Hauser could not have foreseen the fluorescence of his initial efforts to break the back of racial segregation, nor could he have foreseen the ultimate result of his efforts to get companies and investors, sports figures and artists to disengage from South Africa. He always refused to take credit for the subsequent developments that were the work of thousands of others in the United States, Europe, and most significantly those in the American South and Africa who are daily laying down their lives for their freedom. Yet in a time of restri restricted space for dissent, his cultivation of action and advocacy had helped lay the groundwork for the eventual end of de jure racial segregation in the US, de facto as well, and apartheid in South Africa. Throughout his career, Hauser had to face and overcome several challenges that might have dissuaded a lesser man. During the long Cold War, at times he would be labeled a communist, and terrorists by the South African and Portuguese governments and by members of our own Congress as well. At other times, he had to weather accus accusations from the Marxist left that he was a CIA agent. Declared a prohibited, Im prohibited immigrant, he was barred from entering Britain's East, East African colonies. As a white liberal, he was often distrusted by the more militant elements in the black nationalist movement. As a committed pacifist, he had to wrestle with support for liberation movements that were forced to turn to violence. During the struggle for independence, he endured the assassination of many of his friends, among whom were some of the, some of the most promising African leaders. And he also saw several others whom he had supported become corrupted. For someone so devoted to improving the human condition, the long arc of history Hauser had lived through could sometimes be unforgiving. 
if global peace for which he had worked all his life was still elusive. So was the cause of racial justice in the United States and the African self-determination he had worked so hard for failed to produce the peace and prosperity it had once promised. Looking back on such failures might have seemed a cause for cynicism, but George rejected such an attitude. The struggle for a better person, a better life, a better country, and a better world, he said, never ends. Perhaps the moment of greatest freedom is found as we engage in the struggle to achieve it. And that moment is always with us. Okay, I'll stop there and we can entertain questions. Thank you so much, Sheila. What a great overview of this new and fascinating book. I've had the privilege to engage part of it, but you've opened up so many different aspects of his almost century long distinguished career and life. Um, really grateful for that. Um, I want to encourage everyone to both to either post a question into the chat or to put your hand up. Um, there should be a functionality to do that or put into the chat if you'd like to speak and we'll take you uh, your question. I think I'll start with one oh, question and then I know we have- me. Also, you know, Marty and whoever else from the family is on might be able to answer questions that I may not be able to, so. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes, that's a great point. Um, and we will um, certainly take advantage, as you say, both uh, members of the family, uh, including Marty, um, and also there's just so much expertise I see on the line here of people who have dedicated uh, your lives to um, many struggles for human rights, including African solidarity and others. So I know that we'll have a lot to, to open up this evening. Um, I wonder if you might say anything more um, as a starting point um, uh, about uh, something you've referenced uh, at least once during your, your presentation, which is um, as someone who was uh, throughout his life a dedicated uh, pacifist and someone deeply committed to nonviolence as a core for all of his work that he did across these uh, movements, as you note, um, uh, he worked intimately closely with um, both in the United States with people who had a variety of perspectives around um, uh, nonviolence as a tactic uh, versus nonviolence as a philosophy and a way of life, as well as um, certainly throughout the decades of his work with African liberation movements, um, uh, many of the uh, anti-colonial leaders um, used nonviolence again, sometimes as a tactic, some claimed it more deeply, but um, there were many for whom it was just part of a broader perspective, and yet he stayed true to himself, but 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 would work closely with people from a variety of perspectives. So is there anything uh, more you would um, offer about kind of his approach to that and what that meant for George and his work? Well, as I, as you as you mentioned, I think he kept to his own personal commitment to nonviolence. But he was quite tolerant of people who saw it only as a tactic. And of course, uh, in working with the Southern African liberation movements who were forced to turn to violence, he had to make an accommodation to that. And his reasoning was that uh, their cause was so just, uh, they had tried nonviolence in South Africa and it had not worked. And so they were kind of forced to turn to violence. He never, he never glorified in uh, violence. In fact, when he was visiting um, Algeria and they uh, watching these big uh, military parades, he felt very uncomfortable with all the tanks and weapons that were going by. Uh, but uh, he understood that uh, they had no other choice and his support was um, was was totally uh, non-military support. Um, it was, uh, as I mentioned, um, support for refugees and political prisoners, material support, books and pencils, medical supplies, and that sort of thing. So um, he, he was a. He had an amazing ability to work with many different kinds of people and to, uh, you know, respect their position uh, and where they were coming from. 
I don't know, Marty, do you want to say anything else? You have to unmute yourself. Yeah. He was very pragmatic. Yeah. He, uh, I, I remember attending a presentation that he gave in New York um, about Angola. <laughs> and what stuck with me was uh, some man in the audience asked how he could condone uh, the Africans being violent against the Portuguese. Uh, and my dad, I could see him getting really kind of angry. <laughs> uh, and he said, you know, what can you expect when bombs are being dropped on? I, I mean, he just, mm. he just uh, really would feel the plight of people who have no power, uh, who are being bombed. And he had took issue with any kind of judgmental, superior, self-righteous attitude mm -hmm. coming from uh, people who weren't really um, feeling the situation that, that uh, those people were in. Yeah, in fact, you know, it, it, early on in his uh, number, his, his correspondence with Musty, uh, he kind of reveals his um, difference from people in the FOR who were kind of philosophically nonviolent, but really hadn't been in the struggle, so to speak. Um, and I, I guess that speaks to what you were just saying. Yeah, I mean, I think that you're right that that personally, he, in his own actions, would not be supporting violence. Right. But seeing the whole situation in a pragmatic way, mm -hmm. he wasn't taking a position of being judgmental uh, against, I mean, he, he just saw we're all human and mm -hmm. we're all somehow or other doing the best we can. And I, that's something which, which I've certainly gotten <laughs> from him. <laughs> Where, Thank yeah. Um, I'd love to invite in uh, David Hartso um, now for a comment. Your hand is up. David, uh, you're unmuted. Uh, thank you, Sheila, for uh, your presentation and for all your <laughs> very hard work. <laughs> Uh, working on this book over 10 years or so. And uh, it's also good to see so many uh, old friends on this, on this call. And um, I, I guess my question, I would love to hear a little bit more of what you feel, Sheila, were some of the key um, experiences or impacts on George to really commit his whole, his lifelong uh, work <laughs> his life to uh, work for justice and peace, uh, both in the United States and Africa. What were the, some of the influences on him? What was what were some of the major influences that? Well, you know, uh, his religious uh, commitment, his his orientation, his belief uh, in um, a God of justice and a God of peace. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, I don't know whether you heard that part, but uh, he was greatly influenced by the social gospel movement, by the uh, student Christian movement. Um, and those were huge influences on his life. And also, I think by the, um, uh, well, <laughs> There was a whole generation of, of young men who grew up in the 1930s, uh, who became many of his comrades in the struggle, who had the, were influenced by the same thing. So I think it was something in the culture. We don't, 
we don't have anything today like the student Christian movement was in the 1930s. Uh, the Methodist student movement that he was a part of was the most militant of all the student movements. And uh, as a high school and college student, he would attend these weekend and uh, month long work uh, institutes where they would hear from these social gospelers uh, and be encouraged to, you know, work against racism, to work for economic justice and for peace. So um, I think those were the primary influences on him. And of course, he grew up, his father was a clergyman, and so he grew up with, um, you know, the faith. Thank you, very helpful. There's a question in the chat um, from uh, uh, Hoda um, that says, did he, um, uh, do you want to offer it verbally, Hoda, or shall I read it? Hi, um, I'm Hoda. Um, thank you for a wonderful presentation, and I look forward to reading your book. Um, I, I was wondering if you saw any correspondence between George and Shirley Graham Du Bois, who lived in Ghana and then in Egypt. Did she have any correspondence with George that you can remember? I don't know. Um, I mean, I didn't come across any, but that's not to say there wasn't any because George's files, the, the ACOA files uh, at Tulane University and the Amistad Research Center are so voluminous. It's their, it's their largest collection. And I just wasn't able to get to all of the correspondence with Africa in those files. I mean, they were, like 165 boxes of files, plus all kinds of other <laughs> documents. And I, you know, I had to travel to New Orleans where they were kept, which is a, a big expense. I had, I, I had a couple of small grants, but not a lot of money because I was no longer an academic and so my university wouldn't pay. So I just, I couldn't spend the time that was needed to, to you know, get into those things. So there may have been, I just don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Um, I think another topic that was really kind of built off maybe, oh, I see another um, hand up here. So I'm gonna bring in Scott Bennett who noted that you're working on a biography of uh, Ial Rodenko. So uh, I know oh. you have <laughs> Welcome. Uh, thank you, Sheila. Um, I have a question about the founding of CORE. I must confess I've forgotten the exact, um, I can't cite the references now, but I recall that, or I seem to recall that George and um, um, James Farmer had, a, had an exchange of letters or articles on who was the true founder of CORE. Yeah. At the time when I was involved in, in reading all of this, I certainly uh, came to the view that George was the primary founder and James came later. But I noticed, I, I do have your book here. I ordered it for our library. <laughs> so I, I did look at that. And I, you list them, list them both as co-founders. I'm not sure if you were somebody well, being diplomatic. There's, there's a footnote, uh, an end note, <clears throat> that uh, deals with, with that. Um, uh, um, Farmer wrote this memo that he sent to the FOR board um, proposing a mass um, movement against racism. And he took that as, you know, the credit for <laughs> founding CORE, but Hauser was really the one who had started these cells and uh, it was in the cells that they started doing the civil disobedience work. Uh, mm -hmm. Farmer at the time was a traveling uh, evangelist, but he wasn't really doing the day-to-day the, uh, -day organizing. So it was out of the organizing, I think, that CORE developed. I mean, I think 
and and there's an exchange. You're right. There's an ex there was an exchange in the I think Fellowship magazine between the two of them. Uh, uh, Great. Farmer, Thank you. Farmer claiming that he had founded CORE and George rebutting that it was a, a collective experience. So. I think one of the pieces that that brings up for me in, in uh, reading um, the chapters related to that is how you note um, the, um, Sheila, the, the challenges that were happening within institutions including specifically the Fellowship of Reconciliation and all that uh, in this era when younger uh, new organizers such as uh, George and, and Farmer and Rustin and all that were coming into play with um, older institutional leaders. And I think that that is one uh, topic in terms of looking back at that that really uh, evoked for me continuing challenges through movements to today. Uh, the, the, the efforts by new voices to press new ideas and tactics and all that against mm -hmm. uh, maybe established stuff. Would you say that that is really kind of a um, resonant in that way? It's, uh, yes, I think uh, definitely. Yep, certainly is. I, you know, we can see that today and in, in these younger people who are challenging Biden administration as a representative of the older established <laughs> forces. Definitely, in terms of uh, and the way that uh, both both certainly government, as you say, and also movements uh, and organizations that may have established tactics and so forth, but are struggling with uh, what they see as new ways of uh, organizing and, and creating change. Mm -hmm. um, um, let's see here. I'm just uh, looking through the chat. Um, uh, we, we've seen a couple of people have put into the chat questions about um, uh, George's relationship with A.J. Musty, which you spoke to uh, a little bit. Um, do you want to share more about that? He, I, I think you referenced in the book that he considered uh, A.J. Musty very much a mentor. Um, and I wonder if you'd share more about their relationship and Musty, who carried on from, from many decades, uh, indeed, after leaving FOR, did they have an ongoing relationship, even though they were no longer working in um, set the same settings? Um, I don't know about, uh, I didn't run, come, come, run across a lot of interaction be, I, between them much later on, but I'm sure they, they had some relationship. Yes, he did see him as a mentor. Um, Bayard Rustin tended to see uh, Musty as kind of a, a prophet or a, uh, he wanted to kind of follow in his prophetic footsteps. And George never kind of, there was kind of a difference between the way he and, and Bayard Rustin saw Musty. Uh, I, I don't think he saw Musty, George saw Musty as quite, or he, or George himself didn't feel that he wanted to be the kind of prophet uh, that, Bayard saw Musty as, and Bayard aspired to be. So, um, but he, he looked up to him as a mentor and he was always corresponding with him, especially in the early days of CORE, uh, kind of seeking out his opinions on uh, his, you know, what he, what George wanted to do uh, with the organization and Musty, at times would have to uh, dampen George's enthusiasm uh, uh, by saying, you know, um, it, it's going to be harder than you think. <laughs> There's another question in here in the chat um, from Susan Smith, um, my colleague, um, who that further to, I think, the conversation about working within systems or outside the system and pressing systems, uh, asked about um, George's um, relationship to the United Nations. I think you have a, uh, maybe one of the photos in here is um, him testifying at the UN and obviously the work he did in, as uh, leading an NGO framework and all that. Can you speak more to how he thought about uh, engagement with the United Nations and whether he had ideas on what really needed to be reformed as you know, an organization he saw, he saw the starting of, the, the founding of, uh, to a point later on where he was 
pushing it uh, on, on, beha on behalf of and in, and in partnership with um, anti-colonial movement uh, activists. Yeah, well, he was really instrumental in uh, introducing the African liberation movements to the UN at a time when they were totally ignored uh, by the US government and by the United Nations themselves. Um, the, what, what he would do is to, uh, as an NGO, he uh, interacted with uh, people at the UN and especially the Special uh, Committee on Apartheid. But uh, before that, he would, um, you know, seek out people at, at the UN and seek out uh, the ability for these African leaders to testify or to petition the UN. Uh, and this was a very important uh, role, extremely important role that he played because uh, they had no, they had no offices in the United States. They had no support whatsoever. They were completely ignored. And so he gave them space in the ACOA offices to do their secretarial work. Uh, he coached them on how to approach the UN. Um, he gave them speaking engagements with American audiences and through all those means uh, helped to give them legitimacy. And eventually the UN developed the, Amer the uh, Special Committee on uh, against, a, well, I can't remember the exact name of it, but uh, uh, E.S. Reddy was his major contact uh, at the UN after that. And he worked very, very closely. And he, he testified, George testified numerous times before various uh, UN uh, committees. Um, let's build on that a little more. Um, there's a, a um, obviously, as you've said, George worked with anti-colonial uh, leaders across the continent, up and down uh, from west to east uh, Africa, and certainly um, starting the work in southern Africa and up to North Africa. There's a couple questions in the chat of people asking specifically about the work he did in East Africa or with uh, East African leaders in Kenya. Uh, I know that you've talked about his friend Bill Sutherland, who initially had lived in what was once the Gold Coast and then became Ghana and then moved uh, moved to Tanzania and spent a lot of years uh, in East Africa. Um, can you talk a bit about George's work with uh, East African independence leaders and post post uh, colonial, specifically to Kenya? Yeah, well, he uh, George early on brought uh, Tom Maboya to the United States. Uh, Tom was a, a, a rising uh, labor leader in Kenya and um, George sponsored a couple of speaking tours for Maboya uh, that became very, were very popular. And as a result of those speaking tours, uh, Maboya was able to raise money for scholarships for East African students to come to the US to study in the US. And uh, one of the outgrowths of that was the uh, airlift uh, from Africa of these students um, that was directed by uh, uh, Cora Weiss and uh, others, but it kind of was generated by George and the ACOA. Um, and so that was a very important, uh, very important piece for East Africa. Um, in bringing those leaders over to the US and most of them went back to Africa and became leaders in their communities. Uh, one was Wangari Mathai um, and Barack, Obama, uh, Barack Obama's father was also one of these people who uh, uh, benefited from the scholarship fund. So, and, and Maboya directly uh, credited jo uh, George with helping him to raise these funds so that these students could come here. And the students themselves uh, had a profound impact on the United States. They, they helped to, and this is all written up in um, a book about the, Amer the airlift from Africa. But um, 
they help to kind of dispel some of the negative uh, attitudes toward Africa and toward black people uh, because they were so, uh, they so intelligent and so well-spoken and uh, made such a, uh, an impact in the college communities where they, where they went. Um, I see another question um, from uh, David. Uh, your hand is up and then I'll take another one off the chat after that. Uh, David, um, bring you off mute again. Um, thanks again. I guess I would be interested in uh, what you found in terms of uh, George's uh, initiatives and projects that he uh, wanted to take on uh, through his life and, and whether he got full support from organizations like the FOR and CORE and American Committee on Africa or whether he really had the push. <laughs> to... I'm sorry, could, could you repeat that? I didn't quite hear you. Whether, oh. whether George felt he got full support uh, for the initiatives and projects that he wanted to take on uh, during his life from FOR. <laughs> FOR. From FOR. Or um, American Africa, or what he had to really push to get uh, these projects supported. Um, I didn't see a lot about, of, about FOR in the documents that I studied uh, around Africa. Um, I'm just trying to think. Yeah, it's it was mostly the the um, the civil rights community that he got support from in the churches, uh, but I, you know, I didn't I didn't see anything specifically from about FOR's role. I don't know, Marty, do you have any insight in that or? Well, after he, he had a, an ongoing relationship with the FOR, yeah. <clears throat> after he retired, um, he, he was working in a, some capacity with the FOR. Yeah, I think he, he worked as an interim director for a while after yeah. he retired, yeah. Right. But in terms of the African work, I don't, uh, I don't recall. No, I, I don't, I know that there was an ongoing relationship. I mean, uh, we lived in Rockland County in Nyack where the FOR headquarters is located um, was close to our home. So I remember in my growing up, um, there was a, an ongoing relationship with the FOR, mm -hmm. but I, in terms of support for his Africa work that I, I don't, I agree with you that I'm not aware of any direct connection. Mm -hmm. And how about when they uh, did the journey of reconciliation? Was that initiative primarily? That was, a, that was supported by the FOR, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thanks, David. Um, um, as I, uh, let's see here, we have another question from Douglas Smith. And I, I think, um, so this, this question is, what would you emphasize in speaking of George's legacy with young social activists today who probably have never heard of him? Um, and uh, in that, I mean, I think one uh, thing you said that might be something to really wrestle with a little bit is the, um, the, the belief that um, Black Americans were not intelligent <laughs> and all that. I mean, your, your comment about uh, the, how some people were willing to accept Afri Black Africans as yeah. they came to the United States to study here because they were perceived as more intelligent and more uh, less dangerous or less uh, uh, challenging or something like that. I think would be one of those areas of struggle in, in historically and in an ongoing way in terms of the ways there that uh, the um, 
black communities are parsed up and, and pitted against communities of color that are committed, um, pitted against one another. Mm -hmm. so, um, but what do you um, what do you have as, as thoughts about kind of the legacy of this extraordinary extraordinary life for for young people today who really you know in addition obviously you know, read the book <laughs> of course um, but for a young person like what does the impact mean for someone who's really getting in, engaged in movement work right now? Um, well, I, I guess. Um... The way he organized, uh, there, there was a lot of lessons for young people. Um, uh, there's a lesson of one person can really make a difference if they're committed to that goal and unwilling to, you know, <laughs> compromise their principles. Um, but uh, his ability to work with so many different kinds of people and to be non-judgmental, as Marty said, um, I think is an important lesson for young people. There's a, there's, there's a bit of, I mean, what we're seeing today is, you know, this push by the progressive left young, younger generation on the Biden administration there's, there's a kind of a tension there. And um, I'm afraid that they're unwilling to give him a little bit of um, <laughs> time uh, in their, in their um, impatience at, at wanting to see change. And yet I think in George, they, they have a role model of how to how to do that, how to work with an older generation, uh, in a way that doesn't um, compromise uh, that older generation and lend itself to the a right wing attack. I don't know if I'm making sense, but um, I think I mean you write extensively, Sheila, about. Um, particularly about the challenges for movement work in the mid 20th century in the context of a period where communism was to be to be connected with um, communism or perceived as connected with communism was um, was this big X and, and, and created right. um, blockages. And you spoke about that earlier with respect to the different approaches of American Committee on Africa uh, as compared to the Council on African Affairs and how they um, how they took uh, different ways of engaging with it and how the communist label was uh, significant. I saw um, uh, a, a comment um, by Chrissy Stormaker Martinez, our co-chair of our National Council, noting that um, her generation and people uh, like, uh, like she and those with whom she works on the front lines are unwilling to compromise our values. And the questions of compromising that you name, I think are really significant. Um, so that's a that's a really good area of question and tension for how George approached his work and what was going to be effective. Um, let's we've got uh, two or three more questions and then I think we're going to try to wrap up in the next few minutes. Um, um, but uh, I want to invite uh, Anne Stone, um, uh, whose hand is up, to uh, offer a question. Oh, okay, it's a, a bit of an odd question, perhaps I don't know. Um, I, for, as, whenever I, well, when I first heard that beautiful word, Ubuntu, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, I, my heart was filled. I mean, love it and, you know, truth, peace, happiness, eternal optimism, inner goodness, um, the essence of a, of a human being, the divine spark of goodness inherent within each being. To have you Ubuntu is to be a person who is living a genuinely human way of life. And I, I just wanted to ask you, Sheila, what, I mean, I feel George really, really, um, his whole existence was very much caught up with that, with, with that whole philosophy, that whole being. But how did you come up with that? title <laughs> <laughs> um, I 
I saw it in a book, I think it was in George's house. I think the book was a biography of Oliver Tombo, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, um, and I, then I, you know, looked up the meaning of it and I thought that applied to George, you know, that, that he did embody this I, I am because you are. Um, and I, I, it just, it just um, seemed to make sense to me. It seemed to embody, you know, his, his life, his story. I think it's a perfect, perfect title. I'm so glad you have that for a title. I think it will draw a lot of people in. <laughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> Get to know him better, yes. Great title and a, a beautiful cover, I will add. Um, so, <laughs> Quite um, colorful. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to uh, take Carol Bragg's question from the, from the chat, um, who noted that you mentioned that George thought civil disobedience should be used as a last resort. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be something to point out to young people today, Carol asks. Yeah, that's an idea. Um, he... I think that's, uh, I mean, I, I like that as a last resort. I mean, you try everything uh, up to that point, and if nothing works, then you apply civil disobedience. Um, yeah, I think that the kind of, um, you can go too far with impatience, and I think it can create a backlash from the right. And, and so I, uh, you know, I think reading about how George organized and how he worked with people would be an important um, book for young people to read. And I just hope that, you know, <laughs> they might come across it somehow. I'm, I'm fascinated by that because I, I certainly in the part that I read, I mean, again, George in his uh, young um, uh, organizing with Farmer and Rustin and, and the others who were part of the, the core group in, in Chicago that, that founded Congress of Racial Equality. And the, the tactics that they were using were, again, I see as totally, you know, nonviolent direct action tactics. And that was, it seemed to be such at the center. Uh, I'm, I'm sure he embraced a lot of different ways, but it just seems that's a, it's an interesting, um, uh, conundrum because they were again being pushed back by, for instance, FOR's leadership at that time, uh, some of the older yeah, uh, leaders right. who felt that they were too radical uh, yeah, and doing right. too much and they were doing these things. And again, I, I think even beyond that, as you write, um, your description of the journey of reconciliation in 1947 notes that, for instance, um, NAACP and one of the other- support them, yeah. They would not support them because they felt they were doing things that were too radical and would cause more harm than good. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, what they did was laying the groundwork. Uh, so right. I think it's really interesting to see how, again, they as young organizers, and, and indeed your, your discussion of his, um, his process of being part of the Union Seminary 8 and taking that action and, and his internal wrestling. I think those are all examples. So um, I, I wanna ask one more question and I'll keep looking at the chat. Um, uh, I'm conscious that um, in just recent weeks, um, we have seen um, in, uh, in the, on the continent, the what is called the last uh, colonial outpost, essentially Western Sahara, um, uh, continue to be, struggle with its legacy of decades of occupation um, mm -hmm. and the U.S. sticking its foot into that uh, a few weeks ago um, when uh, Trump was still in office. And that um, I haven't gotten to this point in the book yet. I don't know if it's there, um, but I know that in his autobiography, um, George wrote in his, I think, his final chapter about his experience in Western Sahara. And I, I don't know if you have any comments about um, that in particular, um, the, uh, his, his, his travels there. I think, I think you've written about it here and if you yeah. think about that in the context. No, it's in the book, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, as you said, it was the last colonial outpost and uh, he became intrigued with it after he sent one of his staff members uh, to 
the Western Sahara. And um, so he decided to go himself and he uh, had these two trips across the Western Sahara with the guerrilla movements uh, under bombardment uh, part of the time. Um, uh, but he saw it as, as similar to the other anti-colonial struggles uh, that were in other parts of the continent uh, because Morocco, he felt was, um, you know, was, was uh, dominating uh, the Western Sahara, the Sawari people. And he spent some time in their refugee camps and found that they had an incredible democratic um, uh, governing system that they had developed themselves and that women's role was very strong. Uh, and uh, he was very impressed with that. But, and he started to grow a goatee, um, I think it was during this trip. And he said he wouldn't take it off until the Western Sahara was, was liberated. And of course it, it never was during his lifetime. So he kept the goatee. <laughs> I think it was shaved off during the, we saw him a few months before he died and I think it was shaved off by then, but not by his own choice. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, this has been such a rich uh, evening, Sheila. I wanna um, invite Marty to say a final word and then you to say a final word, Sheila, and then um, invite my colleague, Emma Jordan Simpson to, to close our program. Um, Marty, thank you again so much for joining us this evening from the West. My absolute pleasure. Sheila, I just want to say how impressed uh, I am with all of the work that you did over, over more than 12 years. It's a beautiful, uh, I, I'm just so glad that you took on that project and, and uh, worked well, on it. We're all so grateful to you for that. Well, Thank I'm you. sorry I couldn't finish it before George died. I, I know. That's the one one regret I have. Yeah, I know. And But uh, we are all here and he was so happy <laughs> <laughs> to have you take that on. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for the all the support you gave me, the, your family, and, and getting to know you has been a real pleasure. I, I just want to know whether it's possible to uh, read some of that 40% that had, you had to cut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I can, I hope I, I think I still have the whole, the whole manuscript. Um, well, I, I, and my, I will, I'll try to, I'll try to send it to you. <laughs> Love to see it. Thank you. That must just have just been a, a thought, if I might, um, very quickly, the part that you had to cut, um, Sheila, perhaps you could deposit the entire manuscript in one of George's archives, one of the places where his other well, that's materials a, are. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. That probably at Tulane. That's where the ACOA, I don't know. Where do you think, Marty? What do you, which <laughs> FOR or, I mean, the Peace Collection at Swarthmore or Tulane, where the ACOA for, files are? Well, <laughs> how about more than one place? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tulane, the FOR, sure. <laughs> I just know that we in the family would personally like to see. Yeah. It. Okay. Yeah, I would anyway, say both. And thank you, Ethan, and and the FOR for hosting this event. It's really yes, and for supporting me through it too. It's our it's our great pleasure. pleasure. It was our pleasure throughout the course of the period of time that you researched and uh, wrote this. Um, I, I want to pay a particular uh, respect to um, uh, Mark Johnson, who I believe is uh, the one who set that up that arrangement with you to be our, to serve as your fiscal sponsor. Um, we were uh, very um, tragically lost, Mark, as uh, many yeah. of you know, a few months ago. Um, but to have supported you in this modest way and to continue to lift up um, 
this, uh, the legacy of George and Jean. Um, we are so grateful as well, um, uh, Marty, for all your family, but particularly for Jean's life and her uh, legacy. And so for this event, uh, we hope this is the first conversation that continues to open up the stories of in intergenerational mentorship and mutual learning. Um, Sheila, would you offer um, any fun? more fi final words in addition to where where the, the full manuscript can be found, which some of us will be <laughs> eager to, to read. And, and, I hope I, I hope I have, I think I have the whole thing still. Um, oh gosh, I don't know uh, how to close this out. Um, it's been a real inspiration to me to have worked on this book and to have known George and Jane. Um, and um, to learn about the kind of history that he lived through and that he made. Um, so, um, uh, I don't know what else to say. I mean, there's just so much detail that, <laughs> that I couldn't cover in a talk like this. Um, but I did, uh, on his, first trip through Africa um, in 1955, I believe. Um, I went into some detail uh, on that. And so his observations of Africa at that point in history are, are quite interesting. Um, and this was at a time when he was really uh, still largely un, uh you know, his, his knowledge of Africa was gained through this trip and through, of course, subsequent trips. Um, and when he went to Africa, he would seek out people from every walk of life, uh, even from opposition parties and so forth, to get the try to try to get the fullest picture of what was going on, uh, which was kind of interesting to me too. Um, so I, I don't know. <laughs> well, thank you, Sheila. We're, we are really grateful for um, your time this evening, for sharing um, deeply from the book and from George's life. Um, I really, again, want to encourage everyone to consider purchasing one or more copies of the book, uh, especially in the next 48 hours. As we said, we have this really um, special discount rate from the publisher um, and you can access that in the chat. Um, if you want to save the chat from this evening, there's been a very lively and really enriching conversation happening in the chat during the course of our um, uh, public conversation. You just scroll down to the three dots at the bottom right corner of your screen where the chat is and click on that and you click save chat. Um, thank you all for bringing your voices and your expertise and your uh, uh, especially for all of you who have been uh, volunteers in many ways or staff of the Fellowship of Reconciliation through the decades, we are grateful for your um, witness and commitment. And now I want to invite Reverend Dr. Emma Jordan Simpson, Executive Director of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, my beloved colleague, to give us some final words. Emma, thank you for being here. Good evening, everyone. This has been Amazing, and I absolutely cannot wait, Sheila, <laughs> to read this book. Um, I'm hoping also to have um, the opportunity, if anyone else is interested in reading uh, with me, uh, to have some ongoing uh, dialogue about this. Uh, I'd love to. I just, I'm so grateful for um, also the example of your fortitude. <laughs> <laughs> and sticking, sticking with this with this uh, project and bringing it to uh, fruition, I know that you must be uh, supremely satisfied um, with this. So thank you so much. Oh, thank um, you. One of the things that I hear a lot um, when uh, people talk about, uh, in particular, George Hauser and uh, even believe it or not, by and rest in, uh, is that they wonder if uh, younger generations know about them. Mm 
Yeah, they, um, they don't. Well, so, well, help me. I'm here to tell you <laughs> there's a different story. Uh, I remember uh, it had to be like 2008. I had just started to work with the Children's Defense Fund the year before. Hmm. The Children's Defense Fund founded by Marion Wright Edelman. Right. Uh, and, you know, maybe 25 years ago, she did, she launched what she called the Black Community Crusade for Children. And a part of that work was to relaunch freedom schools. And across hmm. the country, every summer, uh, you know, everything from rural towns to uh, inner city um our neighborhoods come alive with Freedom School. Thousands of college students who are working with young people throughout the, the summer, immersing them in uh, the history, uh, not just of culture, but of the movement uh, and movements, uh, domestic and global, and of the amazing giants uh, who were um, uh, so important uh, to liberation. Uh, it's, it's one of the most inspiring things has been to go down to the uh, Alex Haley farm in Tennessee and to be able to sit with many of them um, uh, who uh, were always surprised when young people followed them around the farm and wanted to sit and to talk with them, mm -hmm. to learn from them and to, and to say to them, you know, we don't want to see the back of your head. Like, don't walk away <laughs> when you see us coming. Like, we don't want to <laughs> see the back of your head. Stay around it and, you know, and fellowship with us. But the memory that I'm having tonight, uh, 2008, being down in Tennessee, uh, the, the summer program, the, the college students were so uh, voluminous that summer, 900 uh, college students who were at the University of Tennessee and they were training to be the servant leaders mm. for uh, the freedom schools that they would then be running uh, for the summer. Wow. Uh, loud, loud, loud chants, cheers you know they had to have personalities that were like on a thousand you know <laughs> even to qualify you know to be a servant leader hmm. and they had competi competitions with each other about lesson plans hmm. who could make the most who could create who could write the most creative the most powerful the most engaging lesson plan hmm. and in my um a tour for that evening, for, for uh, the second evening of our, our gathering, um, uh, I sat in on uh, college students talking about Bayard Rustin and George mm. Hauser. Oh, really? really? The title Hauser. of the lesson, wow. <laughs> it's amazing, the title of the lesson was called On Whose Shoulders We Stand. Wow, I didn't know that. That's yeah. wonderful. On Whose Shoulders We Stand. Uh, I'm forgetting the name of the book that they were um, uh, working. Um, uh, it was one that was recently released by uh, about a children's book, uh, middle school, I think, book um, about by Rustin. But they used those, they used the books to develop their lesson plans. And this one was called On Whose Shoulders We Stand. And I never will forget that. Um, uh, one of the things that they said was that dreams and vision and uh, dreams, vision, strategies carved in stone die. Mm. And that our ancestors, and they considered Bayard Rustin and George Hauser to be ancestors. Mm. Wow. <laughs> our ancestors require us to show up with our full selves, wow! ready to meet the moment. These are college students talking mm -hmm. about the work that they were going to be doing mm -hmm. with middle school students. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and part of that work with the, with the freedom schools uh, certainly was literacy and history and, and all that kind of stuff, but they also 
protested hmm. that they they were teaching you know the the very beginnings of civic engagement and mm-hmm. how to sh- and how how to show up in that uh freedom school um uh is still you know very very much a part of my experience i've conducted one uh here in brooklyn with with our young people for the last you know 12 years even before i was in, involved with um the, the Children's Defense Fund. I say all that to say that, um, you know, um, I don't want, I don't want my name in the news either <laughs> if for other reasons, you know. Um, uh, you don't um, put the, you don't publish people's names in the news um, who are trying to do some work on the Underground Railroad. That like really doesn't make, that's not very helpful. Right. But I would not, um, at all um, want you all to leave with the impression tonight that the legacy doesn't continue, that um, people's, that people are not uh, being remembered for uh, the contributions that they made and for uh, the lives that they gave to this work, but also uh, the understanding that a new generation has that they they have to do their part as well, mm-hmm. and um, and one of the things that I so appreciate about John Lewis uh, and uh, uh, Reverend Lawson is the way that they they understood the contemporary Black Lives Matter movement to be uh-huh. one of the yeah. most diverse, uh, powerful, spiritual. Uh, movements uh, that they thought that they would ever see. Um, so the work, the work goes on, the legacy um, goes on. And I know with those young people uh, that I saw, uh, they understand that, you know, hope, dreams, strategies carved in stone die. And that we have to reinvent ourselves, you know, with every generation, because I'm a preacher, so forgive me, but God is always doing something new. <laughs> God is absolutely always doing something new. And the last thing that I would say is that, you know, I spent a lot of, uh, of my career here in New York doing advocacy, uh, particularly a legislative uh, advocacy. And um, it wasn't always pretty. Um, you know, I... I um, I don't regret any of it. I absolutely don't regret any of it. Um, and not just because of what it resulted in, but because I knew that, you know, I had to do my job so that our elected officials could do their jobs. And any elected official worth their salt will tell their constituency, I need you to come and make my life a living hell. <laughs> The good thing is we have a generation of young people who really understand that and they are happy. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't really... happy to, to show up, happy to show up and, and to make their yeah. lives a living hell so that they can do their jobs. Yeah. Um, no, it's but, very impressive, the young people's movement today and, and, the, yeah. and the multiracial nature of Black yes. Lives Matter movement is really heartening, you know. Yes, multiracial orientation, uh, you know, cl- like everything. Like there, it yeah. it is um, an incredible vision enough that it would bring tears to, you know, the likes of, of John Lewis. Mm-hmm. And um, that that certainly, you know, means something to me. I'm so glad that we had this time to, to spend together. I thank you, Sheila, <laughs> for um, these this, these years of sticking to this and gifting us with this. And I cannot wait to read it. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>